Is it God's will for every Christian who gets sick to be healed? That's the question that Dr. J. Vernon McGee asks at the beginning of our sermon today. It's a great question, isn't it? When we've been told by the doctor that we're suffering from some disease, maybe even an illness that doesn't presently have a cure, should we expect God to heal us? Is it a matter of our faith? Can he heal us? Will he heal us? Under which conditions? Now, this is just good debate until this issue hits home. But when it keeps us up at night, then perhaps we're ready to hear the truth. And the truth is exactly what we'll find in God's Word today as we listen to Dr. J. Vernon McGee's sermon, Prayer and Faith Healing. No doubt you or someone you are praying for today are dealing with an illness that seemingly has no answers, and we pray that you find those answers now. Just like this brother who wrote to us an email recently from Burundi, Central Africa. He says, My wife and I have trusted Jesus with our souls, and we entrust our children to him until they choose for themselves. Our oldest son is very sick. We pray over him and have asked our small church to pray, but his condition worsens. Our families have sent local medicine men to our door, but we know these shamen are servants of the enemy of our soul. We will not let them near our son. Our families do not understand, and our son is getting worse. Please pray with us for God's will to be done in our lives, especially for our son, Thomas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for that great love and mercy that reaches down and touches us in our most tender places. Please do that today, Lord, with those who are wrestling with this issue. We think of this precious family in Burundi and ask for your will to be done. May your spirit guide us into the whole truth in this important issue today. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it God's will for every Christian who gets sick to be healed? There are those who make that claim. If your answer today is yes, and you follow that line of thinking to its logical conclusion, you must agree that a Christian would never die for the very simple reason that every time he got sick of any disease that would normally bring death, he'd be healed of his disease. So he could not, nor would he, ever die. He'd healed of every d disease that causes death. Therefore, a Christian would not die. And in order to die, a Christian would have to step in front of a Greyhound bus or go to San Francisco and jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. But may I say to you that the Word of God does not give that type of thinking at all. One of the most cruel hoaxes that has ever been perpetrated on simple believers is God's, that it is God's will for all to be healed, that any Christian, any time he gets sick, should be healed. And added to this false teaching, there is this other thing that generally goes with it, that all sickness is the result of the personal sin of the patient. The one who gets sick has committed some sin, and that's the reason that he's sick. Now, my beloved, then following through on that, if the sick go to a faith healer and they're not made well, as far as I know, I've never heard that any faith healer felt like he was to blame. The fault is never with the faith healer. It's always a lack of faith on the part of the sick, the sick person, or he has some sin in his life that he will not confess. And you can see what that would have upon the mind of a person who's physically sick. It would develop guilt complexes. He'd wonder about himself. I ought to be healed. I don't have the faith. And I must be guilty of some great sin. And this leads all too often, as any of us who are in the ministry know today, to total mental and physical bankruptcy. I say it's a cruel hoax that is passed on a great many today. Now, what is the meaning of James 
in the fifth chapter, verse 14 and 15. Will you listen to the language of James? Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, in the Greek uh, text, there is actually no punctuation marks. The Greeks did not use them. They were supplied it, actually, in the language that was used. So that here it has been man who's put the question mark here. Is any sick among you? It's not an interrogation. That's an arbitrary translation. It's more natural to consider it as a declaration. And this is the way that James is speaking. He says, someone is sick among you. He knew these believers to whom he was writing, and he says to them, someone is sick among you. Even if you take it as a question, uh, he's asking a question which demands a positive answer. Is there anyone sick among you? Of course there's someone sick among you would be the answer. Therefore, we can see here that there was sickness in the apostolic church. Some of that sickness was the result of sin. We saw that last Thursday night and the following Thursday night. That impotent man at the pool of Bethsaida, that poor fellow there, our Lord said to him that to go and sin no more. Apparently, his sickness was the result of sin. And it can be said that all sickness is the result of the sin of Adam. Disease and death has come to the human family because of Adam's transgression. But that does not follow that sickness comes to a Christian because there is sin in his life. Actually, most sickness in the apostolic church was not the result of sin. That is, the records that we have. Paul, for instance, had a thorn in the flesh, and nowhere is it suggested that it was due to sin in his life. Timothy had stomach trouble of some sort, and Paul enjoined him actually to take medicine, for that's exactly what he says, to take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Epaphroditus almost died in Rome. He was the pastor of the church in Philippi. And this man was sick, and it's not uh, even suggested or intimated that it was because of sin in his life. And then Dorcas took sick, and actually she died. No one was there to heal her, and she died. She was raised from the dead, but it's never suggested that it was due to her sin. The fact of the matter is that her good works were the things that were mentioned at the time of her death. Now, the word that is used here also for sick is a very interesting word. Literally, it means without strength. It means a weakness. And Paul uses it like that, and our translation gives it like that. For instance, Paul says to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 2.3, he says, I was with you in weakness. What he means, I was with you in sickness. I was sick when I was in Corinth. And then when he was given that thorn in the flesh, which was some physical impediment of some sort, he calls it, uh, I should not say he did, but the Lord called it a sickness, for he uses the same word when he said to Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness, or in sickness, if you please, so that we have here the same word. Now, there are today, and I'm sure that uh, all fair-minded people recognize that there are many dear Christians, precious saints, who are right now listening to me, who are, are sick. 
they are, they are confined to their bed. And these dear uh, believers have not committed any sin that put them there upon the bed. And on the opposite side, the other side of the coin, there are many Christians that I'm sure you know, I know, that have openly sinned and maybe today are op openly sinning and they're enjoying good health, they're robust in body. So to bring along this argument today that it's because you've committed some personal sin, when you get that straightened out, then you will be able to get your healing. That is, does not follow why God permits some of his dear saints to be laid aside. I cannot understand. I must confess. Don't you know that the Lord Jesus would never sympathize with sin at all? And yet we are told over in the fourth chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, this thing concerning him in verse four, uh, 15 of chapter 4 of Hebrews. Let me move back and read 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And that's the same word for sickness, if you please. Now we are told that he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he was without sin. Now, he would not sympathize with sin, would he? He never did. And therefore, if this infirmity or sickness of the flesh was due to a personal sin, he would not sympathize, and yet he does sympathize with his own today when they're sick. Now, there is another verse of Scripture which is used a great deal in this same connection where it says that he bore our infirmities and our sickness. Over in Matthew, the 8th chapter, verse 17, it says, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And that is uh, always used by those who are faith healers as the, their authority for that. I wonder if it had ever occurred to them that what it really means is this, that the Lord Jesus had no sin nature. And there was in him there was no sin. He was tested like we are, sin apart. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. And no disease, no infirmity could touch him at all because of the nature he had. But we are told here that he bore our infirmities and our diseases. That is the result of it. And we find he gets tired when he sits down yonder at the well. He had a body that under normal circumstances would not. But he bore the result. And yonder upon the cross, he was made sin for us. He bore the result of sins. And that's all that, that uh, Matthew is saying. And he's quoting Isaiah, and we'll go back to Isaiah before we're through this morning. And that's all Isaiah had in mind. He's not talking about physical disease to begin with. Actually, it's spiritual disease. Now, again, there are those that say that there is healing in the atonement. And I may, uh, may startle you. I agree with that. There is healing in the atonement. So is a new body in the atonement, but I don't have it yet. We're going to wake in his likeness someday. Uh, beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And in this body now we groan, but there's coming a day when we're given a new body. That's in the atonement, but we don't have it yet, my beloved. And to begin with, we also have a new heavens and a new earth. And it looks like that We've got uh, those in Washington are going to give us a new earth before we get to the time that God's preparing to give it to us. But nevertheless, it's, not, it's in the atonement. 
And it'll come someday, for Christ not only redeemed man, God redeemed this earth, my beloved. That's very important to see. Now, I personally have never been impressed by a faith healer who wears glasses and speaks through false teeth. Why in the world doesn't this cover the teeth? It doesn't healing cover the teeth and the eyes as well as the other parts of the body. Now let's come back and see what James is actually saying here. What should a Christian do when he gets sick? You see, James is very practical. He's talking to believers. Now he says, what are you to do? Many of you have on your telephone, in case of fire, call a certain number. It's very practical. It's well to have it there. In case of an emergency, you call the emergency hospital or call an ambulance, and you've got the number there. All right, James, uh, beat this generation to that. James says, in case of sickness, I'll tell you what to do. And the qu first question is, and here's something for the Christian today, should he call the doctor first? Not according to James. James makes it very clear. Someone is sick among you. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, we expect, I'm sure, the doctor to come when we call him, and we don't expect him to come if we don't call him. But isn't it amazing the number of people in the church that get sick and they never let the church know they're sick, and then when they do get well, they blame the church for not having visited them. Did you ever have a doctor call upon you and say, well, I just had a feeling that you were sick and I thought I ought to come by? I, every now and then, shaking hands outside, some dear saint here will say to me, well, I've been sick and you didn't miss me because no one from the church came to see me. And I always ask the question, did you notify the church? And the answer, it 100 cases out of 100 is, no, I didn't. My beloved, may I say to you, the Word of God's very clear. Someone's sick among you. What do you do? Call the elders. You don't expect these men to guess when you're sick. Let them know. And that reveals your faith, by the way. You have faith in their prayer. They should be called upon. They should call for the elders. Now, when the elders arrive, what are they to do? What is the procedure? What's the technique? In medical school, they would tell the doctor exactly when he goes into the sick room, they give him a lecture. A young doctor was telling me about the new lecture. They're giving them now to the young doctors when they enter a sick room. There is a certain bedside manner that you're to adopt. And one of it is, and that to me is the strangest thing, you're to make the patient think he's not sick. Then he wouldn't need a doctor. And the doctor could go home if that were true, but it's not true. Fellow's sick. The doctor said to me, you're not sick. I am sick. The reason I've come to you. Now, my beloved, what's the bedside manner of the elders? It's very simple. He's to perform, or they, I should say, never a single one. They are to perform two definite actions. There are two deeds they are to perform. They are to pray and they are to anoint the sick. Now, immediately, when I mention that word anoint, I'm sure that it raised in the minds of those here and those listening in today a complex problem, because we assume today that what James means is this, that the elders carried a little bottle of oil, and they went in and touched the brow of the sick person and then prayed over him. And may I say to you this morning, that is not what James is saying. There is much misunderstanding here because of gross ignorance, if you please. And I wish this morning, I may, am I asking too much to say to you today, push aside your prejudices and preconceived notions for just a moment now and follow through with us on this, and let James say the thing that's upon his heart, that which he's trying to say to believers and don't make him say something else. Now, he says here, is someone is sick among you. Let him call for the elders of the church. 
Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The word here for anoint is a light sun test. It means olive oil. There's no question about the kind of oil. And it literally means to oil the skin. It was a word used by the Greek athletes, and that's where the Olympics began, yonder at Mount Olympus in Greece. They went in for athletics because they believed a person should be perfect in body, mind, and soul. And they develop athletics as no people have ever done. And the athletes would grease their bodies with olive oil before every event. And this is the word that's used. It never means ceremonial anointing. Never does it mean that. Now, actually, in the, in the Scripture, there are three words that are translated by our English word anoint. Muridzo is used only one time, and it does have to do with myrrh. We don't need to look at it. But there are two others. And one of these is cryo. Cryo, and you recognize immediately that the word Christ comes from that. Because the word Christ is a transliteration of the word out of the Old Testament meaning anointed, the Messiah, the anointed one. And this word is used five times in the New Testament. And now will you listen? Four times it's used in the anointing of Christ by the Father with the Holy Spirit. I won't give all of them. I don't want to be tedious this morning. May I give a couple? Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That's the kind of healer he was. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, when the Lord Jesus went into the synagogue in Nazareth and sat down, they handed him the book. He turned to Isaiah on the scroll. He read this particular passage of Scripture, and he says that the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, hath anointed me. And it's this word, cryo, if you please. Now, one other Scripture, Acts 4, 27, for of a truth. Now, when the early church came together after the first persecution of the church, they came together in prayer, and this was part of their prayer. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Now, it's used when it refers to the anointing of Christ. Only one time is it used concerning believers, and that is in 2 Corinthians 1, 21. Now he which establish us with you is Christ, and hath anointed us is God, so that you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit on believers. That's a religious term, ceremonial term, and this word is used, if you please. It is a word that always has a religious connotation and overtone. It's a sacred word. It's a ceremonial word. It comes out of the Old Testament, where you have so much of ceremonial anointing there. Many of us have seen that in Leviticus as we've gone through. Now we come to the second word. James does not use the first one at all. But James uses the second word, alepho doesn't even sound like the other one. It occurs eight times, and it always refers to actual anointings or rubbing on of oil. Let me give here uh, two illustrations for this. In Matthew 6, 17, our Lord now is speaking that when you fast, but thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. It's not the word cryo, it's the word Alepho. And what he means is this. You rub some oil on your head. Make yourself look like you're not fasting to improve your looks, you see. It's a very practical word. And then it's used again in the seventh chapter of Luke. That, and this is the only other illustration I'll use. 
and speaks of this woman that came into the Pharisee's house and anointed the Lord Jesus' feet. And she stood at his feet behind him weeping. She began to wash his feet with tears, did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now she just rubbed them with this ointment. I hope no one thinks this woman who had been a harlot was performing a religious rite upon the feet of our Lord. That's impossible to believe. All she was doing was rubbing his feet with oil. Now, Dr. Vinson, one of the great Greek scholars, says that there is a distinction between these two words that is strictly maintained all the way through the Word of God and even later on in the early church. Dr. Trench Another outstanding uh, Greek scholar said, a lapho is the mundane and profane word, while crying is the sacred and religious word. So that the word that James is using hasn't anything to do with the religious ceremony. It hasn't anything to do with taking a little bottle of oil and dipping your finger and putting it on somebody's brow. James does not say that, my beloved. Oh, if we could only get that point over today. And I say it kindly. It's a result of ignorance that that has grown up to mean that today. It means literally to rub with oil. Rub a person with oil. And the word anoint is still carries to us a religious connotation. It gives a wrong impression today. And let me illustrate. It has such a sacred meaning today, a ceremonial meaning, that if suppose you drive in a filling station and you say, anoint my car, my friend, they would, they would call the man that has the butterfly net to come get you when you begin to talk like that today. You go into the filling station and you say, grease my car. That is a lapho, the word that's used here on the island of Crete. I hope to get there in a few weeks. I want to go to the Palace of Minos. That's one of the oldest civilizations in the world. It goes back 4,500 years. They have found there in excavations an abundance of jugs. They found out what they were used for, olive oil. You see, the island of Crete, even today, is famous for olive oil. And it was used then. It was practical. It was used in the homes of that day for lighting, for cooking, and for medicinal purposes. You see, you'd rub the sick with olive oil. It's practical. It refers to the application of oil to relieve bodily suffering and physical pain. It's not extreme unction. It is something that's done actually to relieve pain. It has a therapeutic value. There is no ceremonial or religious value in it whatsoever. I remember when I was a boy, the Watkins man used to come to our house regularly. Any of you remember the Watkins man? He had everything under the sun. The two things I remember was his vanilla extract and his Watkins salve. And my mother always bought a generous supply of Watkins salve and of vanilla extract. I'm confident that She used that for everything. If you had fallen dandruff or fallen arches, she'd rub Watkins salve on you. And uh, I know that I've had at least two gallons of that stuff rubbed on me, and there's no part of my body that didn't have it rubbed on, my beloved. When I was a boy, the minute I had anything, even a cough, I'd come in, she'd start rubbing it, and then put on, you know, a a little uh, wool... A pad on top there of your chest, that would, and that amazing thing is that always cured too. That was the way it was used. Now that's exactly what James is talking about here using olive oil. In that day it was oil, then it was oil. Today it could mean an aspirin tablet, it could mean smelling salts, it could mean an antibiotic or an operation. If you really want to know what James is saying, when you get sick, call for the elders and call for the doctor also. Call for both. Practical. Use the physical or the scientific 
technique to relieve suffering, and that day it was olive oil. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan, of when he came by and this poor fellow had fallen among thieves and he was all beaten up and lacerated and there was dirt in his wounds. What did he do? Listen to this in Luke 10, 34. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, brought him to an inn, took care of him. What did he do? He poured in oil and wine. Why did he do that? Because, my beloved, he, there's nothing ceremonial about what this good Samaritan's doing. The wine was an astringent. Alcohol would cleanse the wound of the dirt that got into it. And the oil had curative power. And he's using olive oil. It's so used, you see, in the Word of God. And yet we never feel that the good Samaritan was a faith healer. He was just using the means of that day to take a man that had fallen among thieves and use the medicine that could be used. That's the thing that he's doing. Why, medical missions is geared on this today. And personally, I believe medical missions has probably opened more doors than any other method to get the gospel out. I remember visiting Cloy Stewart down among the Moose Goes. Now, he's a, a Wycliffe translator. He's no doctor. But when I walked into his home, the first thing you walk into is a little hallway there, dirt floor. But I've never seen so much medicine that he had around. He had everything. I told him, what are you trying to do? Put thrifty drugstore out of business? Getting all this medicine in here? And he said, no, we, we use it. That's the way we reach the natives. One of them gets the tummy ache, he comes here, we give him something. One gets the headache, he comes in, we give him an aspirin tablet. We are, we are not doctors, but we attempt to relieve the suffering of these people. And that is the thing that James is talking about here. He says that when you get sick, call for the elders. What are the elders to do? They're to pray and they're to anoint. That rub the body this is exactly what he's talking about. Today I say it may mean to give an aspirin tablet until the doctor gets there. Now he says praying in the name of the Lord. And praying in the name of the Lord is very important. I want to develop that in a moment. But notice he says having anointed. And the American Standard Version is the only translation I found that brings out the tense as it should be. Actually, what they should do is, before you start praying, do something to relieve the brother. You see how practical James is? He says, when you get in and the poor fellow's suffering there, may need an aspirin tablet, or may need his body rubbed if he's hurting, you rub him first. Try to help him and then pray for him. This is a very practical sort of thing that James is putting down before us. Now the question arises... Did the oil heal, or did prayer heal? Now follow me very closely. The oil had a definite benefit. Today it would be modern medicine with all it has to contribute. There are those today that don't think you should use the natural, that God didn't give the doctors today. I, th I thank God for the doctors today. And did you know medicine... And hospitals have followed in the wake of Christianity, always have done that. And so, my beloved, God uses the natural. It is just as absurd today for some Christian to say, well, I'm not going to use the means that are provided today to eat bread. God provided bread back in the Old Testament for his people by sending manna from heaven, and I'm going to wait till he sends me a little manna. I have news for you. I do not think God's going to supply manna from heaven to anyone as long as Mrs. Weber and Mr. Langendorf is making bread. Because, my beloved, there's a natural means today to take care of this. Now again I come back praying in the name of the Lord. It means all that He is. 
all that our Lord Jesus is and all that he's done for us. It means to include all of his attributes, and it means to be in the will of God. If you shall ask anything according to my will, he'll do it. And how we need that kind of prayer today. The little girl out on the mission field, the little native girl, was converted. And then she was taught the alphabet. And when she'd go to prayer after that, she'd just start in saying, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And finally, the missionary thought, my, I ought to correct that little girl. And so she said to the little girl, says, why do you repeat the alphabet? The little girl says, I don't know what to pray for. I don't know what God's will is for my life. So I just give him the alphabet and let him make the words. I wish more of us prayed like that today, my beloved. But the thing of it is, he's given us the alphabet and we give him the words and tell him how we want him to do it. And that's the reason he doesn't do it, if you please. You can't force him to pray in the name of the Lord. Now, will you notice verse 15? And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. I believe that prayer does the healing. Will you listen very carefully? I believe in faith healing, but I do not believe in faith healers, and there is a great distinction. When I was pastor in Cleveland, Texas, it was at the end of the Depression, the two that gave more to the church than anyone else were the doctors in the church. We had five in that little church. The other man that gave more than any was the one who ran the Coca-Cola plant. It's interesting, during the Depression, they were the only two who could give, the doctors. One day I was out hunting with one of the doctors on his ranch, and, and uh, I was, uh, he'd just made a generous gift of missions, and I felt like I should thank him for it. And uh, he said to me, don't thank me. He said, you know, and he owned a clinic. He says, you know, people come into the clinic all broken up and mangled, he said, I take them and I clean up the wound, I set the bone, I wrap it up, I put on a little medicine. But he said, if you really want to know the truth, I never have healed anyone. God has to do the healing. And therefore, he says, I've always felt that he is my partner in the practice of medicine. It's always been true of real Christian doctors. In rebounding from faith healers today and other racketeers, there is a danger of neglecting faith healing. Every great doctor, I remember hearing it of Dr. Howard Kelly, and there was a very wonderful doctor out here in Pasadena. I never could get close to him. He was one of these aloof fellas. But I heard one day one of the most wonderful things about it, a nurse in our church out there came to me and she said, Dr. McGee, You've always felt that Dr. So-and-so may not really be a Christian. She said, I wish you could hear him pray before an operation. He said he never performs an operation, but what he doesn't just get down on his knees and cry out to God for God to heal the one who is there. My beloved, I believe in faith healing. I just don't believe in faith healing. I have to believe in faith healing. Some of you have heard me tell this. When I was a boy about 10, living in southern Oklahoma, I had double pneumonia and typhoid fever at the same time. And the doctor came one afternoon and looked at me, and he said, this boy won't live through the night. And he lay down on a bed across from my bed. My mother worked, and then there was a dear little Methodist lady sitting at the foot of the bed, had the very romantic name of Smith, and she wore a sunbonnet. And she spent the entire night, and she kept saying, as long as there's life, there's hope, and God can and will heal him. She prayed. The doctor was asleep over there, but she prayed all during the night. I must confess to you today, I believe I'm here because of faith healing, but no faith healer. She never made the claim of being a faith healer. She was too humble for that. And never went out attempting to do that sort of thing. But she did know how to pray, my beloved. 
I believe in faith healing. That's the only kind I do believe in. Doctors are limited, and we use them, of course, and all the modern gadgets today. But God has to do the healing. The faith healer cannot help you. Call for the elders. They can come. You say to me this morning that, well, they can't heal either. No, they can't, but they can pray. My beloved, may I say to you, this is a ministry that's neglected by most churches. It's neglected by this church. That the, It's a ministry of the elders to pray for the sick. Every now and then someone does call for them, and one of the pastors will go out with two or three of them, and they'll have prayer with them. That's according to Scripture, if you please. I believe in faith healing, and so don't anyone go out of here and say the pastor at the Church of the Open Door is opposed to faith healing. I'm not. I'm opposed to the method in which it's being done today, which I believe is contrary to the Word of God. But now I must close. There is a, another sickness that's the worst sickness of all. It's worse than any physical disease. It's heart trouble, sin sickness. It's the kind of sickness that Isaiah wrote about. In the 53rd chapter, will you listen to him? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Healed of what? Physical disease? No, my beloved. Sin, you say. How do you know he means that? Because instead of going to Matthew now, let's go to Peter, who quotes from him. First Peter 2.24 says, "...who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed." Healed of what? Healed of sin, my beloved. The awful thing that is destroying men today and sending them to hell, he came. There's only one faith healer. He's the great physician. He's the only one I believe in today. And he's a specialist. He takes incurable cases. He takes those that are hopeless and helpless, and he saves them because he died for us on the cross to pay for our sins. That's the kind of faith healing we need today. Go to the great physician and have him lift the burden of sin and forgive us and save us now and for eternity. Faith Healing versus Faith Healers Dr. McGee's passionate presentation today leaves no doubt. God can heal. God does heal. You can put your faith in Him to accomplish His purpose in your life or in that situation that you're praying about today. We'll explore more about how to walk by faith on our daily program this week as we continue our tour through the book of 1 Peter. It's just one of our stops on our five-year journey through the entire Word of God. If you'd like to listen again to today's program, Prayer and Faith Healing, you have several options. It's available on CD to purchase, or you can download it for free from our website, ttb.org. If you'd like help in finding this message or any other message, please call or write us, and we'd be glad to point the way. You can write us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Our email address is BibleBus at ttb.org, and our number is 1-800-65-BIBLE. When you contact us, we'd appreciate knowing what station you listen to Through the Bible on. Now, as you go into your week, let's commit together to walk by faith into an unknown future, knowing that we trust a loving and all-powerful God who directs our steps. God's grace and peace be with you today. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.